So uh, without any further ado and wasting any more time, I'll hand over to Roz. Um, and her title is Inspiration, Perspiration and Serendipity, A Career in Academic Child Health. Thank you, Roz. Uh, thanks very much, John, and hello, everybody. It's so wonderful to see uh, all these uh, names on the screen, and I feel very humbled that you um, want to give up an hour of your time on a bright, sunny day to come and listen to me. So I'm going to share my screen. <clears throat> so the first thing I'd say is, I, I in a very British way, I, I find um, talking about myself and my career slightly cringe-making because... There's nothing really terribly special about me, um, but if if by sharing some of the challenges that I've had uh, along the way and um, and the fantastic support I've had from an enormous number of people, um, if that helps inspire and uh, encourage um, others uh, who are feeling in similar position now to know that you're not alone and we've all encountered these issues before, um, then uh, I'm delighted to be able to do that. So um, I'm going to talk about a lot about perspiration, a little bit about inspiration, and there is a, a degree of serendipity, um, but it's kind of seizing opportunities and making your own luck. So I have chosen, as, as many of you listening have chosen, is a career in academic paediatrics. And um, paediatrics is, is a hard press specialty. Uh, and I was training um, in the 80s when there weren't that many hard press specialties. I was advising a young man who's in his F2 year recently. And he said, oh, but you get called in a lot on call. And I said, well, in most specialties, actually, you get called in on call as a consultant much more than ever used to happen. But it's certainly true that kids get sick 24-7, neonates, um, that's even more the case. And so it, it is hard work and there's a lot of burnout. Um, a very high proportion of trainees are women, um, and there are smaller university departments and lack of critical mass. And whenever we, we sit in the Institute of Child Health, it's easy to forget that, uh, that up and down the land, a lot of departments of child health have a very small number of academic staff. Um, some of them are exceptionally good, but it's that critical mass that I think um, you know, we, we benefit from, which uh, adds greatly to our community. Um, and when I was training, there was absolutely a lack of role models in senior posts. So uh, things are far from perfect now, but I, um, you know, when I think back to the things that were said to me, so at my first interview for a paediatric SHO show job, I was asked whether I was planning to get married in the next year. And rather than saying, I hope you're asking all the chaps the same question, I just said, oh, <laughs> no. Um, but, um, you know, and there's an awful lot of innuendo that people would probably regard as sexual harassment these days. Um, and when I was appointed, uh, as I'll describe in a minute, as an NHS consultant in Liverpool in 1994, I was the first woman with children to be appointed to a hospital paediatric paediatrician post in the region. So uh, it kind of gives you some idea of what things were like. Women in hospital medicine did not have children. Um, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. So, uh, so the attractions of paediatrics on the positive side um, is, I mean, I used to say, and I can say it to this audience, that I, I really enjoyed medicine. I was very interested in infectious diseases, but the thing that put me off adult medicine was that you're dealing with lifelong sometimes self-inflicted conditions because adult medicine you know to me was something that was very much at the older age spec spectrum whenever there was much less opportunity to intervene and to, to change the natural history of the condition. I certainly benefited from a very supportive academic environment um, and although it was quite macho at times. Um, I felt that it was less cutthroat than in many areas of adult medicine. And of course, um, academic paediatrics has been um, recognized as strategically important. And the, the impact of what we do lasts for a lifetime, which uh, to me is, is, is really exciting and important. Um, and I, I, I normally, when I'm talking to a group of trainees, give a sort of um, 
unashamed plug for academic pediatrics. Um, because when one's appointed as an NHS consultant, you know, not a lot really changes until, as my husband used to say, until you retire or die, whichever comes first. Um, you, you know, you, you get into a, a hospital uh, NHS role and um, one can make things change, one can take on different roles, but there's much less scope for that than there is uh, within an academic career path. Uh, so one is able to um, have more control of the working day. There's a fantastic opportunity to develop one's interests creatively, and I'll give you some examples of how I've done that. Um, and you can take things forward into different directions, obviously in a careful and well-considered way, um, but uh, that's certainly possible. And what I love about my job, as I will say, is how stimulating it is, what fantastic interactions one has all the time with some really brilliant people. Um, and that can happen um, in, in hospital-based specialties as well, but, but you know, not quite to the same extent. So this is, now you can figure out how old I am, so don't do the sums as we say. Um, but there's been several crunch points in my CV. So I grew up in Northern Ireland, as I said um, in a recent bulletin, and the 70s in Northern Ireland were a really tough time um, when uh, my father was um, head of the police in the local town. Um, he used to go out, we didn't know whether he was coming back. I think we were actually not really terribly aware of all of the, all of the dangers he was in because he didn't talk about it. He's talked, he talked about it subsequently, but it wasn't, it, it wasn't easy, but it was kind of normalized, um, as I think happens in many war-torn uh, corners of the world. That, that you go to school, you have friends, you go out a bit, um, but, but there's always that kind of tension. And so I was really keen uh, to go across the water, as we used to say, to university. And that was important. Uh, applying for Cambridge was a complete punt. Um, nobody at the school had ever prepared anybody for Cambridge entrance um, uh, and I applied late and they let me apply late um, because normally you know Oxford and Cambridge you have an earlier application date I had six weeks before the entrance exam I thought well I'll just give it everything I have and work really hard and if I do if I get in fine if I don't it's only six weeks uh, but by some miracle I, I got into Clare um, uh, and then the, the crunch point after that, went to Westminster in London, the crunch point after that was moving up to East Anglia, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And then subsequent crunch points are shifting from an NHS consultant role into academia, uh, and then um, moving up later in my career from uh, being head of department uh, in, into a more national role. Uh, and then coming here. And of course, I was at Alder Hay during uh, one of the biggest uh, scandals that has rocked the NHS and university um, and NHS university partnerships. Um, uh, that partnership was under huge stress. Um, I had had no involvement whatsoever in any of the events that were under criticism. So I became a head of department at quite a an early stage, um, which was also interesting and challenging. Uh, so this is the town I grew up in, um, where the mountains of Morn sweep down to the sea. Very beautiful, um, uh, but very kind of rural and um, unsophisticated. So I came to Cambridge, I felt like a complete duck out of water. Um, with uh, the male to female ratio of about nine to one in those days. And um, most people have been to public school um, and I hadn't and I spoke with this funny accent that people couldn't quite understand. But great place, made lots of firm friends uh, that have lasted and uh, it was a unique experience. Um, I then went on, as I said, to Westminster Medical School. Now I showed this slide to a group of um, uh, Welcome Trust Fellows. Uh, and I said, you know, there's nothing special about me. I didn't get any prizes at medical school. I was president of the student union. Um, I, I didn't, you know, uh, excel in any way. And one of them prefaced the question, you know, for such an 
uh, un, uh, uninspiring medical school student career. How have you managed to? And I thought, well, that wasn't a complete disaster. Um, I did pass all my exams uh, and had a pretty good time. But I was just trying to reassure people that, again, there's nothing special about me. I, I did. I, I never really considered doing anything apart from paediatrics um, for reasons that I've sort of already referred to. And uh, I'm partly helped by the fact that everybody in my family worked with children in some way. My mother was a teacher. My father, when he retired from the police, he worked um, with the legal aspects of, um, of child protection. Uh, so, you know, there's a big focus on the vulnerable end of that, that vulnerable end of the life skills. So anyway, I did paediatrics. Um, so then this crunch point. So um, in autumn 1986, I was about to get married. That was quite stressful. Um, uh, I, was, I hadn't passed my MRCP. Um, uh, we were moving out of London. I had no idea where. Um, I was kind of following um, my husband to uh, another part of the country. Um, very few women in hospital paediatrics, certainly no women with children. I wanted to have children. Um, so I almost gave up because uh, it just seemed completely bonkers. And, uh, you know, I remember talking to my husband about whether I should just do general practice. And he said, you do whatever you want. Um, but it's just as well I didn't because I don't think I'd have been a very good GP. Anyway, I got married, um, passed the MRCP, which was the biggest surprise to me, and, uh, and got a paediatric registrar post in East Anglia, and all of that happened very quickly. So um, I felt pretty low um, in uh, October 1986, and in the middle of November 1986, I felt pretty good. So my advice is that if everything seems to be heading in the wrong direction, just be patient and stick with it because uh, things change. Um, so in those days, there wasn't really much in the way of organized uh, training, clinical training, never mind academic training. You could sort of do your own thing. Um, and I worked in Ipswich uh, where the consultants were really supportive of me and very much talking to me about the next step in my career. And they, they um, I, my husband was on a rotation from Norwich to Cambridge. So we were going to live in Cambridge. Um, we, we had to move in the rotations in those days. So um, I knew uh, we'd be moving to live in Cambridge and I thought that'd be quite a good place to do research. And I thought, if I'm going to get a decent consultant job, I need to have an MD. So I better suss out some research at Cambridge. And there was a post advertised for a medical registrar. So I really didn't pay much attention to it, but I do remember showing it to one of the consultants at Ipswich. And he said, so this was a medical registrar evaluating heart lung transplantation for cystic fibrosis, which I thought was mainly in those days a condition that affected children. So um, this chap, Jim, said to me, you know, you should think about it. You get great training in immunology. You get great experience of that. So to cut a long story short, I did apply. And I was then in this really intense academic environment um, with the heart lung transplant program at Papworth. Lots and lots of research and many, many different things. Very macho environment, quite challenging in many ways. You sort of sunk or swum. So, um, I don't recommend the macho aspects of the environment and one had to work very, very hard. Um, so I, I did it and I, I got my MD and, um, but people would say, you know, when I'm a professor and I said, oh, we, do you want to be a professor? And they said, well, well don't you? And I said, I, I, don't, I don't think that's, I'm up to that. You know, I'm just doing this so I can have a, a, an MD on my CV and, you know, um, maybe that'll help me get a consultant job wherever we manage to end up. So when I say that, you know, look what happened to me. Um, you know, one's per perspective changes. This is the lab at Cambridge that I worked in. Um, and uh, Keith Peters had recently gone up from the Hammersmith to be the Regis Professor at Cambridge and he brought a whole entourage with him. 
So uh, Les Borisevich is looking into his beer on the right. So he subsequently became professor of medicine in Cardiff and um, a vice chancellor of the University of Cambridge, chief executive of the MRC. Uh, and so and Tony Wheatman is far left. Um, Tony Wheatman uh, was laterally PVC in Sheffield, um, both very distinguished clinician scientists. Uh, and then I'm um, doing something stupid in the middle. Um, so, so then um, my, my husband decided that he wanted to do pediatric anesthesia. Uh, so that meant um, that we wouldn't be in some lovely rural location, but in a big city. And he applied for a job at Liverpool. I had been to Liverpool once to get the boat to Belfast. I knew nothing about the place. Um, and he, so I think somebody needs to go on mute, if, if you wouldn't mind going on mute. That'd be great, thanks. Um, so he uh, had his consultant interview and the day of his interview was the closing date for a senior registrar um, application process. So he, uh, back in the day, you had to put things through letterboxes. He put my application through the letterbox once he knew he'd got the job. And, um, and I was about 18 months into my research at, at Cambridge. And so they interviewed me for that job and they wanted me to start immediately. Um, and I remember the HR woman, as I walked down the corridor to the interview room to be told that I got the job, she said to me, they're going to push you to start straight away, stick to your guns. So I did, <laughs> and uh, I managed to, uh, to, to extend the start date uh, so that I could finish off all my work. Uh, I didn't quite manage to write up my thesis, um, but, uh, but that was good advice uh, from HR. Um, and then uh, I, I'll talk in a second about some of the clinical work I got involved in, clinical research I got involved in in Liverpool. But I had a pretty strong CV and the university wanted to return me in the RAE. So I think about two weeks before the RAE census date, uh, they interviewed me for a senior lecturer job and I moved to become an employee of a university. So this was a kind of serendipity um, kind of crunch point. So um, I was working a lot with children with cystic fibrosis. And um, at that time, um, they, were having, they were having to swallow huge quantities of um, pancreatic enzyme capsules with uh, every meal. And the companies have brought out some high strength preparations. And uh, my colleague um, who ran the clinic, he decided that everybody should move to this because it would mean that they would only have to take about a quarter of the number of capsules, which seemed perfectly reasonable. And then one summer in 1993, we noticed, uh, well, well, hard to not notice it, um, five boys, it was six in the end, but five boys came in with exactly the same picture of uh, intestinal obstruction and an x-ray that showed a, a very, um, a very severe narrowing of their colon. And we reported that in The Lancet in 1994. I cannot tell you the opprobrium and the opposition and the, the criticism that was showered on us for A, for reporting this, this is by the CF clinician community, A, for reporting this, and B, suggesting there was a link with high strength pancreatic enzymes. People said, if you put this out, children will stop taking their enzymes. You won't be able to control this. There's no evidence. Um, and uh, uh, another professor of paediatrics in a city quite close to Liverpool went on radio and television saying that it was um, irresponsible uh, to suggest that there could possibly be a link. Um, anyway, we did. And uh, then we did a, a ca case control study uh, where we, um, we ascertained all of the cases in the UK and there were 14. So other clinicians were seeing them, uh, but not, uh, not making any link. Uh, and we showed, um, we showed a very strong association between the use of high strength pancreatic enzymes, but it was related to some of the 
products, but not others. And that then led to uh, another um, huge uh, controversy. But we could only report what we had found. Um, uh, I had no commercial links with any of the companies. Um, I was simply an academic uh, trying to find the answer to a very important question. Anyway, um, what happened was that the MHRA took the appropriate regulatory action, which was to withdraw the products with whom the link had been found. And the problem in the UK stopped. So um, that to me was a really important outcome. But that, that was, um, that, that one had to be brave to do that uh, and not pay attention to people who told you you were doing something reckless, but to trust your own judgment. And there were all sorts of other issues with the case control study, which was also published in the Lancet um, and people doubting the findings and calling our integrity into question. And I worked very closely with a wonderful person, uh, Deborah Ashby, who's a very close friend and she's a medical statistician. And that has given me a lifelong uh, regard for biomedical statisticians. Um, now, another example of <clears throat> inspiration, perspiration, serendipity. I can't honestly believe that the slide on the left we published in the paper in the Lancet, but we did. So Paul McNamara uh, was a research fellow with me. He's now a professor in Cambridge. And I was applying for grants to work on um, RSV, uh, which is a very interesting virus um, and one that we've subsequently done a lot of work on. But I had, you know, I, I wasn't uh, getting these grants and I made a decision. I applied to Action Medical Research and I sat on the panel of Action Medical Research and I made a decision that if I didn't get this grant, I was not going to put any more in, in this area. I would turn my attention to something else. And, and you know, I remember going out of the room for the discussion of the grant, I had no involvement in it. And it was one of the most stressful um, experiences I had. And my husband said to me, he said, you know, you're a big girl now, you've got a big head above the parapet and this is what you have to do. And if they don't like it and they, they're saying things that you, you know about it that you wouldn't, it would make you feel um, embarrassed or, you know, that, that's just life, you just got to do it. Anyway, I was very convinced at the end of the meeting um, for no reason at all that the grant hadn't been awarded, but to my astonishment and delight, it was awarded, um, it was above the funding bar. So um, what we did in this paper is we, um, we've, we find when we looked at the babies, that in their lungs, there was a lot of interleukin-9. And this is uh, back in the day, this is a long time ago, we were doing RNAs, protection assays. And this is what Paul did. And he showed with these, all of these babies, a very strong band in the IL-9 zone. And this is not um, a cytokine that anybody had associated with um, response to RSV infection. And we demonstrated, and then Paul went on and he developed uh, his own ELISA to, to measure the protein. So we, we um, were measuring protein here. And in the babies with bronchiolitis, on the day of intubation, when they're very most sick, um, the IL-9 levels are very high, and then they reduced uh, over time with recovery. Um, and this is compared to controls. And what we also showed was that this type two cytokine uh, was produced by neutrophils. Um, and that's uh, shown in this slide here. So um, that led to another very interesting avenue and, and piqued my interest in the role of um, granulocytes in uh, response to infection in RSV, which is something that um, I've continued through to the work that we do here. So um, in the midst of all this, um, I had two wonderful children. Um, so Thomas was born in 91 and Rihanna was born in 93. And um, I've had a wonderful husband who's kept me very grounded. Uh, so, and then this is um, just a kind of word cloud. Uh, when I came to ICH, I did a word cloud of of terms in all of my publications. And uh, this gives you some flavor uh, for the sort of work that I did. Um, and actually cystic fibrosis and RSV have a number of things in common, 
inflammation, host response to infection, uh, and so on in the lungs. So there was lots of, um, you know, two very different conditions, but lots of uh, uh, similar uh, avenues of inquiry. Um, so then uh, in 2004, so as head of department in Liverpool, um, we'd had a really challenging time with the older hay inquiry. We were trying to rebuild, I was trying to rebuild the relationships between the trust and the university. And um, I was also working in drug regulation um, uh, and working with Terence and others um, on the Pediatric Medicines Expert Advisory Group. And um, there was a legislation going through the European Parliament to require companies who are developing new products uh, to test them in all relevant age groups. So if they were developing, um, I don't know, um, a new product to reduce uh, gastric acid, uh, and it might have a, an indication in children, then it had to be studied in children. And not just, you know, older children, but neonates, if that was, if that was the age group that might be uh, able to benefit. So what the UK did um, with N um, NIHR and under Sally Davis's leadership, it was developing um, research networks to focus on strategically important areas. And the UK developed, in response to this legislation coming through, what was called the Medicines for Children Research Network, because we did not have the wherewithal to do a lot of clinical trials in children. In fact, doing clinical trials in children at that time was somewhat controversial. There'd been a number of inquiries. There was the Stoke inquiry, there was the Bristol Heart Inquiry, which was not specifically about research, but which related to research. And um, the morale amongst pediatric researchers was pretty low because um, there was a lot of criticism about the way in which, about whether the research should be done with children at all. So, um, so organizations were invited to bid to become the coordinating center for these networks. And so with colleagues from uh, Imperial and the National Perinatal Epidemiology Unit, Peter Brocklehurst uh, and the National Children's Bureau, we, I led a bid uh, on behalf of that consortium uh, with the University of Liverpool. Slightly awkwardly, we came up against a bid from the place that I now sit in, um, but we were successful. So let's move on swiftly from that. Um, and uh, we were able to establish the coordinating centre in Liverpool. We were able to award funding to support a research infrastructure, which was able to cover about half of England. And uh, uh, our review at, at the end of three years um, it was, was very positive. So uh, what this slide shows is the number of trials, the growth in the number of trials. So publicly funded and again, we were able to work with the funders to encourage them to have calls for research in this area because there's many, uh, many studies needed to look at the use of different therapies for children that will not be sponsored by the companies because they're not of commercial interest. But we also took on lots and lots of industry sponsored studies uh, very successfully as well and worked really creatively and positively with colleagues down here who were one who became one of the local research networks and indeed uh, a very successful one uh, at that. Um, so uh, and this slide shows the number of children uh, that were involved in studies over that time and you know it was really fantastic to go from a very low level to having lots and lots of children. We did this in partnership with children and families. And I went on radio and television was asked, you know, was it ethical to, to experiment with children? I said, everything we do is with the advice and partnership of children and families. Um, and that's what we set out to do, to provide the best infrastructure in the world to support these studies, um, to provide an excellent base for clinical research in children for the global pharmaceutical industry and to also ensure that world leading research appropriately addresses the needs of children, because as we all know, children often get forgotten. And then I came here <clears throat> um, to this wonderful uh, 
place, which I have had the most brilliant uh, time working with, fantastic group of colleagues. Um, and I, I could talk for a very long time about all the positives. Um, so the Institute of Child Health clearly was Europe's leading center for pediatric research and teaching. How could we make it even better? That was the challenge. How could we go up? We were in the top five in the world. How could we be top? And I, I've got lots and lots of reflections on that. Um, but one of, you know, everything we do is dependent on our people and we have some amazing people here. There are amazing people everywhere. I worked with some really brilliant um, academics in Liverpool, but here there are so many of them. And what we have is this great critical mass. Um, so we, together, we developed this strategy. We articulated what our principles should be and they're listed there. Um, and we, after a lot of um, work and brainstorming and thoughts, we identified what the key areas, um, which were initially called programs and now called departments should be. So when I arrived at ICH, there were 23 or so research units. Some were very big, some were very small. And it was, to me, it was quite a confused picture about what, you know, what ICH was really good at. And uh, so, so it was really fun to work with people. And I made a few suggestions and then they were taken away and hugely improved and uh, came up with great titles. And hopefully that's given us a great, greater clarity of purpose. Um, uh, which has enabled us to be more successful. So I'm going to sort of slightly change tack and say what typifies the successful academic. So there's a whole list of things and I put more emphasis on some than on others. Uh, so tenacity, uh, which is perspiration, I guess, confidence and ability to write. And I'll say also say a few words about mentorship. Um, so this is what Louis Pasteur said about tenacity. So tenacity is, is coming back, picking yourself up when you don't get that grant. Um, you know, that paper is not accepted by the journal and thinking this is not a reflection on me. Um, this, is just, this is just part of what happens. And the people who, the successful academics have box, but well, we don't put them in boxes anymore. I used to keep boxes of my unsuccessful grant applications. Uh, and the people who succeed are the ones who pick themselves up, dust themselves down and come back and try again. Um, and then confidence. So this is a particularly an issue for women. Um, and I, uh, through the Academy of Medical Sciences, mentor um, a number of very bright women and I have done so for a very long time. Uh, and quite often our discussions um, are me trying to persuade them how good they are uh, because they are extraordinarily good. Um, so I, I, I think one does need confidence. Um, so the reassurance that, that lots of successful people have had lots of failures um, is helpful to know. Um, to try and have an inner confidence in yourself and that is acquired very gradually. So. You, know, you have a crack at something and then it does come off and that, a bit like you know my first RSV grant with uh, which Paul McNamara worked on it went really well because he was a fantastic PhD student but then it led on to other things um, and it comes from a whole range of different perspectives. The ability to write uh, cannot be overemphasized and I have huge admiration for those of you that write in English as a second language uh, because it's the nuances, the subtleties around language that are really difficult. Um, but this is something that as an academic, you have to be able to do um, because I, I spend a great deal of my time assessing other people's written uh, applications, their submissions, um, critiquing um, uh, written work that, that others are putting in for submission. Um, and it's just kind of, Present, it's that presentation that is, is so important um, and it, 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 it's really worth working on. And attention to detail. I'm not a great detail person, I can tell you. Um, I'm much more of a big picture person, but I've had to make myself pay attention to detail because it is so important. So I'm not the lady having all the shoes tried on. I just try one pair on and off, I'm off, but uh, it's important to do that. Um, 
uh, and then mentorship. Uh, so men I think mentorship is really important. And, you know, the jobs that we do as clinical academics, and I appreciate there's a lot of folk out there who aren't clinical and, you know, the jobs you do are, um, are very challenging also. Um, and if you try and explain it to somebody in another sector, well, you know, I look after patients, um, I lead my own research program, I teach, um, I'm involved in, you know, leadership in, internally, and this is what I do for other organisations, and they're just kind of quite, it's, it's very, very diverse. So you need to have a mentor who kind of understands all of the different directions in which one can be pulled um, and will help guide you as to what to take on, what to give up. Um, and how to prioritize. Um, and I've talked a little bit about my mentoring experience. I, I really enjoy mentoring. I enjoy being able to help. And it's, it's interesting when I talk to people how, you know, my view from a distance, I can bring a perspective that they haven't thought about. Um, uh, uh, and it's great to, to do that and to see you know some of the suggestions that I make and um, then being implemented and uh, and that helping and these are the sorts of issues it's not just about you know who do you collaborate with or what, what's your next uh, application going to be there's a lot of personal issues come up um you know work-life balance uh, I've talked about confidence and then there's also a lot of how to handle um interpersonal conflict so these are all issues that everybody struggles with um, and, uh, you know, it's not my job to intervene. It's my job to empower the individual so that they can sort it out. Uh, and when does mentoring start and stop? Well, in my view, it doesn't ever stop and it should start as early as possible. And I have benefited hugely from um, usually informal mentorship because it's only become formalized more recently. But um, I, as I say, I've benefited hugely from a lot of people's support, you know. And I can think Deborah and I, uh, whenever we went through all of the challenges from the, um, the pharmaceutical companies around the uh, colonic strictures issue, you know, we talked to each other a lot and, and gave each other a lot of peer support. Um, so uh, just as I come to, towards the end, so what does my job involve? My son used to say to me, Mom, I don't really know what you do. Uh, I don't listen to say that anymore. But, um, you know, what is it that you do every day? You're in an office all day long. Well, sometimes. So um, clearly I love uh, being director of ICH. Um, and, you know, but I think 10 years is, is a good innings and it's the right time to hand on to, I'm sure, another very talented individual. Um, running a research group is important and a PhD students need a lot of attention, quite rightly. Uh, and, you know, I, I, actually, I started supervising uh, PhD students with, with Deborah Ashby, who was very much immersed in the, um, in the university system. And I learned lots of, uh, you know, the right way to supervise a PhD students, um, you know, to make time to, to both supervisors to meet together to be very clear about the objectives and so on. Um, I love being part of a clinical team. Patients keep you very grounded. Um, certainly in Liverpool, my asthma clinic was, um, uh, uh, it was great fun and, and some wonderful, um, wonderful patients and children. Um, the national work is really, really interesting. Um, I've been chairing for the last five years, the MRC uh, fellowship panel. Uh, it's a lot of work but it's just hugely rewarding to, to be able to help some really talented uh, people uh, on their careers. Uh, and then the international commitments um, are very exciting and it's been great representing this institute with um, the collaboration that we have with Boston Children's, uh, Sick Kids Toronto uh, and the Murdoch in Melbourne. Um, and that, that gives you a great sort of umbrella perspective of the strength of our science. So I can't say there aren't any tedious aspects. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of fighting for things on your behalf, particularly uh, budgets and finance, um, representing you know something I'm very passionate about. Um, a lot of stuff kind of um, it's a bit like the the duck paddling on the water, they seem to glide along, but there's an awful lot of 
uh, paddling underneath. Um, and sometimes that's exhausting. Um, so there are aspects of the job that, um, you know, are not uh, are slightly less stimulated than others. Uh, but as I said before, I love my job because I'm largely in control of what I do. Um, it's very lots of variety, uh, opportunity to modify, move into different areas. Uh, I'm passionate about research and about its ability to really make a difference for children and in so doing make a difference to somebody throughout their life course. Um, from a sort of selfish person point of view, it's just great the friends that I've made and the fantastic people I've worked with um, in all sorts of different um, committees and panels. Uh, and, you know, we all take our work very seriously, but we, you know, we have a good time as well. Uh, and I cannot express adequately what a privilege it is to have been able to provide uh, leadership to this fantastic institute um, and the really wonderful people uh, that work within it. Um, you might be wondering what happened to those uh, two children. I'm sorry, this is a bit dark. I took it in an airport. So um, that's, that's the seven year old and he's uh, now 30. And that's my daughter, who's 29, and their two partners, Sonia and uh, Chris, his fiance. And um, it's been great uh, to have them with me on the journey also. Um, so I'll leave you with a thought. When I was um, starting my research in Cambridge, Sir James Black was awarded the Nobel Prize for Medicine. And this quote has stayed with me ever since. Your ideas begin in the, I mean, as clinicians, we are uniquely privileged. I work with lots and lots of non-clinical colleagues who's, who I have huge regard for, but I feel that as a clinician, we have this responsibility to work with the patient, in our case, the child, to understand what the problem is that needs to be addressed, to ask the children and families what the problem is, you then eliminate clinical problems with basic research, and that is done in spade loads in this institute. You relate your studies always by measurement and you proceed by rigorously controlled clinical trials. So there you have it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ros, for a fantastic overview of where you've been, what you've done and what you've learned along the way. I think there's a huge amount to take from that for hopefully everyone on the call. Um, does anybody want to ask any questions? Um, you can do that either in the chat or um, by raising your hand. I see we have a hand already, Marta. Hi, uh, thank you very much for a fascinating, really interesting talk. I especially appreciated uh, you sharing your experience as a young woman trying to make it in academic science. I have a very specific question regarding family and, and you spend some time talking about family was was your decision as to when to have children strategic or is it kind of the case that there's never really an ideal time and, and one just sort of bites the bullet and, and takes the plunge kind of you know was wondering if you have any thoughts on that uh, so thanks Marta actually I was going to tell an anecdote about that uh, just to illustrate um, some of the attitudes at the time when I was a research fellow, I went to a meeting at the RSM and met somebody who'd been my senior registrar when I was much more junior. And uh, she asked me what I was doing. So I said I was doing research in Cambridge. She said, oh, that's very interesting. Um, you can have your babies when you do research because they don't mind too much if that's when you have your babies. And I was absolutely appalled that first of all, who they were and whether I should really care at all what they minded or didn't mind. And I suppose also that kind of research was regarded as this dilettante activity that didn't really matter. So, you know, if you want to take time off from maternity leave. So, um, uh, so, I, so I always wanted to have children, but um, I was working so hard doing research, it was difficult. Um, so when I went to Liverpool, um, my SHO, um, I was a senior registrar, my SHO, who uh, Terence knows well, um, she was pregnant with her second child. And I thought, blimey. Um, and I actually, in Rebecca's case, um, she'd been a real trailblazer. And, uh, um, 
you know an example to a lot of people and so um so i i decided i would start my family then um because uh, and she but and we you know we shared lots of uh experiences of working in hospital medicine and trying to have a family but it wasn't easy I mean we were doing really tough on call rotors um so it was challenging thank you um we've got a couple of things in the in the chat about mentoring uh one of which is somebody asking you to be their mentor so that's uh uh, clearly, you, uh, um, your approach to mentorship appeals. Um, the other question is, um, how do you find mentors? I'm not sure whether that's meant to be mentors or mentees, um, but in terms of you know finding mentors or mentees. Oh, well, I think, John, you're well placed to answer that question because the um, EDI groups uh, set up a good system for mentorship. But um, so I don't know if you want to say anything about that. Uh, well, that's Vanya's uh, core core uh, area, really. So I feel like I shouldn't speak for her. But I mean, yes, of course, you know, mentorship schemes uh, such as the one that um, is now being run not only at the institute but across the um, across the faculty is uh, you know a good way to find mentors. Um, I don't know whether there is any proactivity on your side in terms of how you decide on mentees, though, because I imagine you get more requests than you can take. <coughs> Um, so my, most of my mentorship is through the Academy of Medical Sciences that have got a great scheme uh, where people go to them and then there's a sort of database with some information about potential mentors and they choose the mentor and so they've all chosen me and they're all women. Uh, I'm sure there's a correlation. Um, I try not to say no because I think it's such an important thing um but but you know one has to set boundaries so it shouldn't continue you know indefinitely so having a, a period of 18 months or two years to start with because these things often reach a kind of natural break uh, and then it's probably appropriate for the individual to seek another mentor um after that uh and it but the other thing i would say is that because i was sort of in my earlier years there wasn't really much developed around mentorship is that uh, quite a lot of the input I've had has been very informal um, and you know I've I've sought people out and they've been very um, willing to give their advice and I've known that when I you know although I don't see them regularly when I'm coming to a crunch decision time like moving here or you know another big decision that you take in your career just knowing that you can get in touch with somebody and have a chat to them about the pros and cons of, of what one might do um, has, has certainly been very helpful to me. Great, thank you. Um, there's one other question which has been sent uh, to me directly, which is um, about the future. So um, it says, thank you for sharing your wonderful journey. Where will life take you next? Um, well, uh, I'm I, I'm sort of going to step down from being director. I will continue to be a UCL professor, uh, and um, I'm likely to take on another part-time senior role within UCL. Um, I've also uh, taken on a couple of board positions recently, knowing that I'll have a bit more time. So one is uh, with the an institute in Bangladesh which um, focuses on diarrheal disease and was the, the um, center that developed oral rehydration therapy for treatment of gastroenteritis, which has saved billions of lives worldwide. Um, and Bangladesh is a country and, you know, with particular challenges, not least related to climate change at the minute. So I'm very committed to that. Um, so I'm, I'm going to take on a, a cup. I've taken on a couple of board positions like that. I, I, I'm going to just pause because I don't want to take on so much. I end up just being just as busy as I am now, um, and I want to have a little bit more time uh, to travel. And as many of you know, uh, we have this wonderful place in France that I just love uh, spending time. So I'll have a little bit more time to do that. Uh, well earned. Uh, um, I did have a, a question of my own, actually, which is um, about some of the, you mentioned 
getting a pushback on some of your research um, with, with regard to the uh, CF medication. Um, in the era of, you know, if you were doing that uh, research today in the era of social media, how do you think that, that that would go differently? Do you think that, I mean, social media is a double-edged sword. It gives you a chance to, you know, get your findings out through other channels, but it also, you can be, you know, a place where you get pylons and, and various kind of exaggerated reactions uh, to things. How do you think that would be different if those, those sorts of fine controversial findings come out uh, these days? Yeah, really interesting and hard to assess. Um, you know, I think the, the trolling and the, um, the kind of unacceptable um, challenges that people face whenever they make, report something that others don't like it is just really damaging and um, I'm sure is extremely energy sapping uh, for, for people who experience that. And I, you know, I feel really strongly, I know other people who, who conducted research and asked a question that's come out with an answer that others don't particularly like. Um, but that's, that's science, that's what the evidence is. And um, it's, you know, it's, it's up to you to report it. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think difficult. I don't really have an easy answer. I'm not a great social media user. Um, I look at tweets, but I don't tweet very much myself. Um, but uh, I, I think the potential damage that um, academics can suffer is, is really bothersome. Yeah, and we've certainly seen a lot of that during the pandemic. Does anyone else have any uh, any further questions? Ask me anything you like. Come on, there's an offer you can't refuse. Can I can I ask a question? Is that okay? Yes, of course, Amy. Go ahead. Thanks, Ros. That was fantastic. Um, just one one question: Have you got any tips for how to prioritise the things that you get asked to do? <laughs> I think one of the things I struggle with is a kind of junior person is you get off to all these lots of really interesting amazing things to do but it's it's quite hard to find what's the right thing to say yes to and what's the right thing to say no to yeah I mean um it's very flattering to be asked to do um different things uh and so I, I you know and we're all guilty of taking on more than we really should and sometimes you have to do that and just accept that for a period, you know, you, you are going to be working too hard. Um, but what I, what I always say to people is do things that you're really passionate about. And then in time, once you've, you know, delivered on something, you know, you should also think, well, what do I have to give up so that I can take this on? And have I you know, been on committee X for a reasonable number of years is, is it appropriate to step down from that um but i mean what i care about is training and careers and so it's you know it's not a, although you know the work for the mrc panel and i also chair the academy starter grants panel you know that's at times there's a big bulge in work and you know working evenings and weekends and so on because i really care about it, it it's less of a chore so I think follow your passions and fulfill your responsibilities to other things that you've committed yourself to but don't be frightened to stop doing them once you feel that you've delivered what you need to on that thank you saying no is an important skill for all of us uh, Russell thanks <clears throat> um Ros very very interesting and it's it's always, well, you said it yourself, but it's always so reassuring to see other people's careers in retrospect and not necessarily linear, but, but uh, quite discursive in lots of ways. It's not really a trick question, but I was just wondering any regrets, any paths not taken that you, you wish you had in a sense? Um, it, you know, it would be very, I've had such a wonderful career, it'd be very churlish to be regretful about anything. Um, it, yeah, I mean, I spent a long time in Liverpool. I, I'm very fond of Liverpool and I couldn't really move 
until I did because I couldn't move when my kids were in um, secondary education because that's the worst possible time to uproot them. Um, so, you know, if that hadn't been the case, perhaps moving before that um, would have been an option. But always one is, you know, there are unintended consequences if, if you do something differently. Uh, and, you know, I'm very, you know, I've had a wonderful family to support me and, and they still do. So that's been incredibly important. So I can't think of any, Russell, I'm sorry. You've put me on the no, spot. Good. I'm, I'm good. sorry. Well, that's actually that's nice. Okay. No, no, it wasn't meant to be a trick. It was, it's nice and reassuring, in fact. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so in the last minute, there's one more question uh, in the chat, which is, um, if you're uh, comfortable answering, what was the toughest part of your personal life? Did you find motherhood daunting? How much support does one need as a mother in academia? So I think the toughest part of my personal life was when I had two very small children. I was doing a one in three on call. And my husband was doing a one in four, which meant that his, his regular on call night was a Thursday. And so when he did a weekend, he went into work Thursday morning. I didn't see him till Monday evening. And I used to say I felt like a single parent. Um, and we and because we of childcare, we, we tried not to be on call at the same time, which meant that we had fewer weekends when neither of us was on call. Um, and actually, when we talk about it and look back, and we don't really know how we got through it. Um, but you do. Uh, so uh, that that was really tough when the kids were, were very small. Um, uh, things got better because the on-call got less um, later on. Um, but but uh, yeah, that, that, that was definitely not easy. Um, and th how much support what does one need as a mother in academia? I mean, I think one does need support, but it's great that so many women you know are having children all the way through and and uh, and that that gives great reassurance it's very positive lovely well we're out of time so that's where well, i worked out well thank you so much again ros for taking the time uh, and for participating in our um, women's history month event and thank you to everybody for joining us um today and um i hope you've enjoyed it found it interesting and um we will end the session there thank you <laughs>